I'm a proponent of being selfish, self-centered, being self-aware of the path, the, the, the journey that we're creating for ourselves. Because in terms of entitlement, no one else is going to do it except us. No yeah. one else is going to give it to us, even with the whole support group. Like, I feel like my family has just had to accept <laughs> Raquel's a job hopper. There's nothing we can do. Um, this is how she wants life. Welcome to Gratitude Geek. I'm Candice Rodardi. Today I'm joined by holistic career and lifestyle guide Raquel Sands. Welcome, Raquel. Hi, thank you so much. So what is a holistic lifestyle? Yeah, well, I should just start by saying I, I changed the title <laughs> since I, I last um, emailed you. I go by bilingual career coach, uh, but it's, it's kind of the same thing. Honestly, I still do holistic perspective and modalities in career coaching. Um, but I just swipe that because of the confusion. What is a holistic career coach? <laughs> uh, well, so to answer the question, it is a career coach who uses holistic practices. So I am a yoga teacher. Um, I do some mindfulness yoga nidra practices, um, as well as some of the career kind of support, LinkedIn, resume. So both together. So you're basically looking at a whole body perspective to what what work is like. Okay, so you changed to bilingual coach. Does that mean you're coaching people who speak two languages or are you? Correct. Okay. Yep, yep, correct. And what are some of the challenges that bilingual people might have when they're searching for a job? Oh, well, first, bilingual um, could mean different things. So like me, I'm first generation Salvadorian American. So what that means <laughs> is that I'm the first of all of my family, except for a handful of cousins uh, that was born in the US. So the, all of our family is from Latin America. So that experience can be jarring because we grow up in a nuclear family that does not identify, does not speak the what the country speaks and, and how our country is. Uh, so that's one. Also, I work with clients who are immigrants. So they come either at a young age and they identify with American culture, but they come from speaking primarily Spanish. Um, and then when you get into the workforce, there's business talk, there's slang, there's all sorts of things. So being bilingual is, I think, more than just the language. It's more of also the, the energetic, the intricate things that go on in the workplace, what we identify with culturally. I was talking about this this morning because I have a multicultural yeah. family, a multicultural background. Yeah. And my mother yeah. was, I'm, I'm first generation as well. My mother came here when she yeah. was 10. Um, yeah. Different culture yeah. though, Korean, not, you know, yeah. so it is, there is, yeah. it's a different way. I, I, I mean, I literally yeah. was just having a conversation about this. Yeah. It is a completely different yes. view, a lens that you look at with yes. from the world when you have 100%. a, really strong cultural connection to another country, uh, yes. which doesn't make you any less proud to be an American. No, it right, just means right. that you have a different lens that you look at. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. And especially when, like, for example, I had uh, a, a huge advantage that my mom did get her master's, like she went through the school system um, before I did, even she did as an immigrant. So I got to see what she went through. And so when I went through it, even though we're, we're in different situations because I was born here um, and she had to learn on her own, um, I had a huge level up and I got to see uh, what happens when people who, are, are, who don't identify with your culture because they don't understand it or they don't like it or <laughs> whatever it may be, um, how to navigate a system that wasn't set up for people who come from other countries, who have been here <laughs> and are finally working their way through the system, um, and then in my case, also, my family, uh, most of them are, are a mix of white and blue collar. And so I didn't, I didn't know what box was mine, what job would be mine. And now I'm a solopreneur. There's nobody like that in my family. So you always <laughs> so have to be the first. It, you always have to be the first. Yeah. So it did, just comes with so much nuance. <laughs> did you have, in, if you look at your family history, do you have a lot of people who like were business owners in your, in like way, way back? Do you know? I mean, my dad, that's one of the things I was going to say I'm super grateful for was my dad and my, my mom, because they both in their own way were trailblazers for me, um, even though we can't have similar, we're not in similar boats. But yeah, my dad, um, he he started as a 
what do we call it? Maintenance teacher. He taught air conditioning and electricity. Uh, but then he's like, no, F that. I actually want to <laughs> be my own entrepreneur. And he started a school out in Southern Florida. I'm from South Florida. And um, he, that, that was his whole thing, teaching other men, other people um, who, who wanted to learn that trade, who wanted to do it for themselves. And, and he got people certified. He worked with Florida education system. Uh, and that was my first job. I was <laughs> his uh, accountant, his secretary person. Um, so that was great. Yeah. Seeing yeah. that example. Mm -hmm. it's, you sometimes think that, oh, I've, I come from a long line of workers, people who are always at a yeah. job. And then you yeah. discover that, no, that entrepreneurial spirit, you don't have to go very far back in time where everybody I was a farmer, that. right? Most, no, most right. Families, and owning a farm is a, is a business is a business yeah. 100%. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I always thought that, you know, my dad worked for the, for the government, my mother always had a job, but my grandmother yeah. owned her own business and my dad's grand, both of my dad's grandmothers, my wow. dad's grandmothers, wow. both of them own job, own their own businesses, you know, and, and it's, yeah. wow, I guess, I, I guess I'm not unique in this. <laughs> you did, I know, <laughs> it just runs in the family, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. something that you mentioned um, in, when you pitched yeah. the show is that you yeah. teach people about job hopping. So what is that? Yes. yes. So that's something that I've, I've claimed for myself in a, in it, it took time. I should, I should say to claim that because it's, it goes so against what the cultural conversation oh, heck in yeah, the United it States is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you get it, you go, you go to school, you get a degree, you commit to that, whether you think it's going to, you know, pan out or not, but, um, and then you stay. And I think um, I, that didn't work for me. So I job hopped. So <laughs> for a long time in my career, I would say my whole career, I, I would quit after a year, after a couple months, um, not because necessarily the people were bad or anything, but it, there was not a fit for me. I felt like I couldn't be there for a long time. And I think that's so much of the narrative. You have to find a job that's going to work, that's going to pay the bills, but that's going to stick and you're going to be grounded. Um, I've been out of college 10, 11 years. So I've been a job hopper 10, 11 years. Um, and I've, I've done government contracting. I've worked for fortune 500, 500 companies like Deloitte. I've done nonprofit. I've been a freelancer. Like I, I, I would, <laughs> I hope my mom who, if she listens to this episode <laughs> would really appreciate that. I have really tried, you know, people give it their best. Um, but it, it just never worked for me, working in a cubicle, working in a corporate environment that can feel very toxic, uh, putting the cultural nuance aside, but just being in that environment. Um, so that's what, for me, job hopping is. You try different jobs, kind of like dress shopping. You got to try it on, <laughs> but in job, you can't try it till you buy it. You have to buy it first. Um, you have to go all into the job and they give you a 30, a 90 day promotion period. But what if they don't like you, you don't like them, then, you know, you still have to kind of their cart, they're holding all the cards. Yeah. But um, I really like the job hopping. What I call job hopping philosophy is that you try before you buy. So in an interview, you're putting all your, you know, it's like speed dating. You're asking the tough questions. And then if you already are in this situation that, okay, I don't even like this industry, but I just need it for the money then whole, having that not that deal breaker in your mind, I'm only going to stay in for a year and then I'm going to do something else because we start something, we commit to it because we think that's the right thing. That's what's been shown us. And then we're afraid to quit. And then we end up in a very negative you know, situation that we can't get out of when you should have job hopped to begin. You should have just shopped around a little bit, give yourself a time frame, um, and then leave, leave when you're ready. Yeah. So you're right that most companies hire you on, you know, corporations hire you on with a 90 day trial period. And, yeah. you know, you, you're, you're, you spend the whole time thinking, you know, are they going to keep me? Are they going to keep me? And then, you know, that anxiety. Um, yeah. And really in today's market. Yes. You are special. You know, yes. there aren't a lot yeah. of people. I mean, they, they, there are more jobs than there are people. So yeah. why not? Go yes, into it with, exactly. I'm going to interview you and see if this job is a good fit for me. Exactly. So balance exactly. that with entitlement. Because, you know, somebody somebody listening to this podcast mm -hmm. and this conversation is going to say, oh, my God, what a bunch of entitled people. So balance that for me. <laughs> well, um, I, well, number one, uh, in the word entitlement 
something in my mind also comes with like this word of deserve. We deserve. What do we deserve? And for me, I feel like when people are put between this rock and a hard place of I can't leave the job or I have to I have to suck it up. I have to bear it. Um, no, you don't. I mean, money, this this might sound very blase, Mary, whatever. Um, I have a college degree, so I, I do have a place of which I can move around with. I have something that can take me to different positions. Um, but we all need a certain amount of money. It's not a matter of deserving. It's not a matter of I'm entitled to that money. We all work for, <laughs> we all have different number one roles. There's different ways of looking at work. Um, I have some clients who are, have been caretakers. And so they have to caretake while they are looking for other jobs. And so they can't leave. And that are happens they entitled? more and more today. And that happened. Yeah. yeah. And, and then people, you know, have to work. I feel like commuting is part of work. I feel like the emotional mental element is work. So is there a sense of entitlement? No, because I feel like as a human right, <laughs> we all should get our basic needs met. So and I don't think that a is a shift in, in culture for this country. Yes. For the United States. Yes. So we're recording this in the United States, not Canada. In the United States. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is that, but that exactly. is a, that is a shift in culture because yes, our parents, our grandparents, they didn't think no, that way, yes. you know. No, they they yes. worked for the company and and you know and and you know back in the hundred years ago, if you went to work for a company, you stayed there your whole life and you'd retired with a pension. Yeah, that, that doesn't yes. exist anymore. There's no exactly. So what is the entitlement? Because I would also want to feel in like. I, I, I'm a millennial. <laughs> I don't know if people could tell, but um, I, some of the younger generations, you know, they come in wanting six figures. I've my, one of my previous jobs two, three years ago, I, I'm a solopreneur now, so I, I don't work for someone else now. Um, but in my previous job, I, I also had a sense of why are they asking for this much money? They haven't earned it. But in my mind, I had to also do a reframe house cost of living is expensive if they ever wanted to have a child and create things down the line for their own lifestyle benefit it's not a sense of entitlement when the system whatever state you're in whatever industry you're in is not set up is not intrinsically set up to support the employee well when, um, when minimum yeah. wage is what's gonna call we're gonna call it ten dollars it's not what right. it is, but if minimum wage yeah. is ten dollars and it right. costs you fifteen dollars to get a McDonald's hamburger, Imagine, you have to work for right. an hour and a half to pay yes. for that hamburger, and that doesn't even include exactly. taxes. No, exactly. And then to drive, like gas, like all of these little things. Yeah, so and, it's not uh, unreasonable yeah. to want to make right. more than ten dollars an hour or twenty. No, you no. know, it's it's not exactly. a it's not unreasonable to take a look at the expenses that are in front of you, and right. this is you know it's. If I want to rent an apartment, it's going to cost me twelve hundred dollars a month, and I need to right. make four to eight hundred dollars a month just to have an apartment. Exactly, you know? exactly. No, exactly. Yeah, and that's where I struggle with the entitlement because I feel like there's something about a base level. We're just talking about needs here. We're not talking about everyone being millionaires and yeah. having Teslas and <laughs> whatever yeah. else. So, so there is like that balance of like what what is the baseline for most people's needs. And then what is it that is different individually? Like for me, I know that I'm very content living in an apartment. I have no need to buy a house because that's way too much economically and, and maintenance. I, I like having a maintenance person to come and call. Like there are certain things that um, I think need to be balanced and like taken into perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we're not Europe. For everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was something that I, I found out about actually um, that in the United States, uh, I'll find the article if I can and then send it to you, that there is no federal law that requires PTO. So uh, no uh, employer has to actually pay for paid time. So what's that mean? Already some companies give two weeks. That's the norm. But there's 365 days in the year. There's 12 months. So we're not even getting a whole month. So if people want to talk about entitlement, it's like, I would say people need at least a month, at least one solid month. Um, well, which is what they do in Europe. Which is what they, is the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah that, I and, I, and I don't think that that's an entitlement either. So like yeah. 10 years ago, it may have even been longer than that. 10 years ago, I was having a conversation with a woman and, you know, minimum wage has been $7.80 since like 2012 or something like that. 
twelve. It's been it's been seven dollars and eighty cents for a long time. So this conversation wow. happened around the time that the minimum wage changed from six dollars and seventy cents to seven dollars and twenty cents, or seven dollars. I mean, it was not a very big big change. And I was, you know, I was having this conversation with this woman, and I was said, I really don't understand why fifteen dollars an hour is such a stretch. I mean, you really. Right. I mean, this was 10 years ago, years ago, okay, right. 10 years ago. It is a lot more expensive to live a today lot. than it was 10 years ago. Exactly. And she looked at me and she said, I don't think that people should get paid $15 an hour. That's how much my husband makes. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. your husband could get a job that makes, pays him more, but more, you know, so right. Just because you make $15 an hour doesn't mean somebody else shouldn't. Right. Exactly. You know? Exactly. No, it's, it's wild it's wild because even you know I had a I had a conversation I think with a family member who does not have a degree I'll just put that disclaimer because I do the only reason I say that is because I was in debt right to to go to school in this uh, get a degree in this country you have to get in debt so that's not an entitled thing we all have to suffer in order to level up and and get some level of of stability so that's putting that aside um that conversation of minimum wage of but Raquel, you used to make $30 an hour at put after having put myself in debt $40,000 for a degree. Now, if I, this is the cultural nuance, wasn't uh, empowering myself to ask for a raise, to job hop, to do the, the, the maneuvers in order to get myself into a better position, the, the price, my salary would have never changed. And, and my, my rent, all everything, because I live in the Washington DC area would have continued to rise oh, because everybody that's just- That's a very expensive metro to live in. It, it is, yeah. So you have to ask for a raise and you have to put yourself in positions where, no, actually in my last job, I made 80,000, even if you made 60. Like you have to start to bargain because yeah. it's, uh, if not, no one, unfortunately, again, and it's not to say the system is to blame. It is a big part because it's, it, if, if the system, if the foundation already is, it's like a plan. <laughs> if it's already rotten, if it's not nourishing, then what else is, what are people expecting are going to bloom from this situation? And of course, there's only so much accountability and action an individual can take, but then that's assigning the blame to the individual who just endures the situation, was just brought up in the environment. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, I think that that's, that's also part of the thing to think about. The, the thing is that your degree is, doesn't guarantee that you'll have a good paying job. Exactly. There are good union jobs that pay two or $300,000 a year, yeah. you know, really good union jobs. You don't have to have a college degree to get a good union job. Right. Right. You know, exactly. um, so it, it's whatever is the right thing for you, but, but having your debt, your, I mean, your college debt, you know, you yeah. join a, you, when you join a union, you pay union dues, right? So dues, nothing right. is free, right? Nothing There's is nothing free. is yes. free. It's just a matter of no. how you, how you go into it. Right. Yes, um, exactly. Exactly. But there, there are, there, there is a place for everybody and everybody is needed. Again, 10 years ago, a lot of people were like, yeah. oh, these kids, they go to college and then they become baristas. Well, it's because <laughs> that was the jobs that were available. Available. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, it's yeah, not that they yeah. want to be a barista, but that's the job no. that's available, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And for a variety of reasons, like going back to that caretaking thing, what if they actually did have the time, but they didn't have the energy or the access or, I mean, yeah. people are juggling so much now that it's like, even if they wanted to, you know, yeah. <laughs> sometimes it, it's not. So I, I, I don't know. I think entitlement, if, if I said anything about, I think entitlement, I would say the people who already have access to wealth if anything, because they already have a solid foundation from which to work with. Um, so how much did they work? I don't know. Hopefully they, they're creating their own basis and their own, you know, like for me, if I said I, I had some level of entitlement, um, my mom was already working towards her master's degree. So when I was born, I already had someone who I could have a role model and, and lean off of. Some people in my case don't even have that. Yeah. and have a, a more complex situation. So I think it, it's nuanced. Um, and I, I don't know, I just hope that if anything, there's more empathy, there's mm -hmm. more compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I hope to cultivate in my in my coaching business, because it's uh, everyone comes from different situations. And it's not for me to say what what anyone else should do. It's what they're able to do what they're willing to do. 
um, and their starting point is so different. And so it's just the, 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 the compassion, <laughs> most of all. So you've talked about it a little bit, but what led you on this journey to being a coach? Yeah. So putting that whole job hopping 10 years, um, most of my roles have been in communication. My degree is in English. Um, so it, it actually turned out pretty practically for me because everyone needs a writer. Everyone needs an editor, regardless if it's finance role, if it's a health, whatever it is. So, um, I got to be pretty good, I think, but I, but I, um, I kept working with people who would come to me, I think because of the yoga, <laughs> I would tell people I'm a yoga teacher on the side. And so they, they see me as kind of like a hippie mindfulness person. That's fine. I, I identify with that. Uh, but asking for advice, you know, how, how did you land this job? Um, I noticed in your LinkedIn, you worked with so-and-so. And so I would start slowly mentoring. Um, I remember some of my colleagues would come into my office and cry. Oh my God, I want to move to Arizona. I don't know how to do it. How can I make such a huge shift in my career? My parents aren't okay with this. How do I have these conversations? Uh, how do I believe in myself to even apply to ask for more? So I started slowly, but I didn't officially claim the, the coaching title until two years ago. Um, and, and I started as a life coach because I didn't feel brave enough to call myself a career coach. Um, but, but it just slowly started, uh, people were saying, no, I'll pay you to do my resume. I'll pay you to actually help me figure out all of this out. Um, so I think it happened organically. Um, and then just me reflecting on my journey. I also have a podcast where I just talk all about my journey and holistic tips for career, uh, switching. And, uh, I think it just, I was like, yeah, all I do is talk about career and I talk about <laughs> how people can create their path. I don't know if find a purpose. I think that conversation is also very nuanced, um, but how can people create a life, not just a career? Because my whole thing is the career is part of your life. It's not just a separate thing. This whole work-life balance. Well, what is that? You're, you want your whole life to be balanced, but your job is one part of that, that hopefully supports your life, hopefully can fund all the things you want to do. Um, so all of that, I think, just happened through coaching people in my job um, and then me just taking that ownership. Well, I like that you use the word guide to describe what you do, that you're a guide. That's nice. OK, so imagine I, I mean, I know that you're a millennial and you, you you don't have any friends in this situation yet. Um, <laughs> but imagine that you have been a, 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 a client comes to you and they have been a a stay-at-home mom raising their kids mm. and their kids are all mm. grown up and they want to go mm. and get a job. Yeah. How yeah. do you, how do they navigate that transition? I think one, if depending on what the foundation is, because I, I always try to start with where the person is. Um, I don't just say go get go back to school or go like if that's not in the in their budget, if that's not in their time frame, it's it's not useful. So depending on what they already have, I would either ask them are you still interested in that path? Are you trying to grow? So for example, I worked with someone who was an HR professional. She's not a stay-at-home mom. She has two, two dogs. <laughs> so she's a, a, a dog mom, uh, but she was no longer interested in HR. So I said, how can we start to take small steps because you're not interested in going back to school uh, to get you into uh, her thing is organizational psychology, specifically for um, accessibility, making work more accessible um, for hearing, for people who are vision impaired, all these things. So I said, which is okay, under the HR umbrella, which is under HR umbrella. Right. So for, so that's the same thing I would say to a stay at home mom. If you already have skills under your tool belt, we're just going to brush them up. We're going to do the whole LinkedIn resume because we need to see, um, un unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know how people take it, but that's what people view is that first impression. So I would work on that with them. And if they're not interested, no, Raquel, I want to start from scratch. Then the question is more so, okay, what is your time like? What is your financial energetic capability? Um, and I always recommend people to do these courses like Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, just tap your foot in, just see what your interests are before committing. Because my whole try before you buy philosophy is let's not put so much investment in a master's degree in an MBA that's not going to really turn out because what if one year, two years down the line, you change again because of your, your children, because of the lifestyle. So um, I really try to take into account the lifestyle piece so that they're not, it, it's not more stress on them. 
Um, and then if they so choose, they're like, no, actually, I want to be an entrepreneur. Then great. Then we start taking steps. But I think it's starting where they are and then seeing what are the next best steps. So talk to me about this Coursera and LinkedIn learning thing. Yeah, so I actually did a, a project management. That was one of the things that I, I always tell people. I'm like, if, if you feel like you're interested in another industry, take one of these online courses. I love Coursera. Um, they do a free trial uh, for 30 days. So you Can you spell that for in. me? Yeah, course, C-O-U-R-S. E R A for sure. Okay. I think that's okay. Yeah. There'll be links in the um, show notes, y'all. There'll be links. Yeah. And uh, it's great because they they partner with so many different um, universities throughout the US. So you depending on so I did program management, but they have HR if you want to be a human resource generalist or so many different certifications. And you get certified. And going back to the LinkedIn thing, you attach it to your LinkedIn. So you're showing the whole world that you have expertise, you have some sorts of knowledge. Um, so you're credited. So for me, um, they have two different membership options or two payment options. You can do month to month, which I think is um, like 30, 40. But I did the yearly for $400 the whole year. You can do everything. I mean, you don't have to pay certificate by certificate. So rather than job hopping, your you're, rather than job hopping, you're course hopping. You're course hopping. Absolutely. Everything <laughs> is hopping. <laughs> Everything is happening because I, I also feel like, you know, in this day and age, number one with technology, uh, there's a lot to be said for, you know, that whole everybody was afraid of AI and AI is taking our jobs. But it's like we need to learn how to uh, take advantage of yeah. those resources if yeah. we can. Right. Again, the money, the time, the energy. Uh, but especially if in my client's case or in the stay at home mom case, if she has the time. And if she can carve out some of this budget, then that's an easy way for people to start to kind of just get a taste. I thought LinkedIn learning was free. I think it used to be. I'm not sure now. Is, I haven't are used are they charging now? Oh, let's I find out. So I know. Yes. Out. I've <laughs> never done a LinkedIn learning course, but I might now that I've had this conversation with you. You should. Because, <laughs> well, you know, when, when I did, became a business coach, I actually took a certification in uh, business coaching. And I finished it. I mean, it was supposed to be like this week long course or something. I finished it in like two days. And then I yeah. took the test and I passed the test on my first try. And I was like, this is yeah. the stupidest thing I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, none oh, of this no. is having owned a business for the past 15 years. Nothing that no. I just learned is practical. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. LinkedIn learning, LinkedIn mm. learning platform. Mm. One month of free. So you get a free month. Okay, what does it cost after the free month? It's fourteen ninety nine a month billed annually, or nineteen ninety nine a month after that. So LinkedIn Learning, um, I, they were free for it could a be while. A good, yeah, yeah. So yeah, either resource, and they both. I like both of them because, well, my bias is LinkedIn. Every if if people are looking for a corporate environment, let's put it that way, then LinkedIn is really the place to be because you network, you show your skills, you. Uh, you get recommendations, you show all of your work samples. Uh, it's just a great first step, uh, especially if they're coming back to the workforce, they're changing industries. Uh, yeah, but if, if they're not interested in corporate world and it's more an entrepreneurial thing, then it's kind of free for all. I mean, there's so many ways to start a business. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah. LinkedIn is also a good place for people who support folks at work. Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's a good place for you to hang out. I read yeah. somewhere that only like 3% or 5% of LinkedIn uh, users actually post. Oh. So yeah. if you're not, if you're supporting people who are job searching, yeah, you should be you posting. Go. And by supporting people who are job searching, it's not just coaches, it's public speaking people, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any, anybody who's giving you a skill set that's going to help you get a better job. Yes, exactly. should be exactly. posting. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, the thing with says the, the whole, woman who doesn't post. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, LinkedIn is its own world. So it, it, it really is. I mean, I've seen things where people will put looking for work on their profile. And so it, it shows me uh, as someone in their network, whether they're a friend or colleague or whoever, um, oh, okay, they're looking. And, and like you said, they help support to see if they're changing industries. What do I know? Who do I know? What can I do to ser serve them? 
um, or build up an, uh, something for them. So yeah, I think LinkedIn is, is useful, maybe not to put all the eggs in that basket, but it's a good starting place. That open for work thing though, if you hate your job, <laughs> Do oh yeah, put, don't, do I, not put open for work. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, please don't do that. That's the whole, don't do it. That's whole don't thing. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Yeah, don't do we it. don't. We don't want to burn bridges unless unless you really don't care. But like, <laughs> try not to. Even back in the day when AOL was like the only social oh media, gosh, way yeah, yeah, back yeah. in the day, uh, yeah. I put I had put something in my profile that I was looking. I was thinking about moving to a town or something. Oh. Right. I just put yeah, that yeah. in my profile. <laughs> And my boss comes in the next day and says, I saw that you were looking for, <laughs> I was like, oh, oh God, it's like, don't ever put anything like that on no, any of yes. your socials. It's too much. Yeah, <laughs> because no, they, no, no. they, 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 I mean, that was they AOL. They know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they exactly. Know. They will know. Prote they you know will protect know. yourself at all, at all, yes. at all costs. Exactly. Exactly. There is, um, if you are looking for work though, you can do recruiters only. So I've done that in the past where that they have that function. I, I can't remember exactly the, the steps, but um, there's the section, I think, open to. And uh -huh. so you can say if you're open to work and then there's that, you know, don't <laughs> don't put to everyone. Yeah. But you can put to recruiters so that in your network or in the industry you're in, they will get some sort of pain. But still, uh, what if mm. the people who are recruiting are actually working for the company that you work for? It's still a... It's a slippery no. slope. <laughs> I've, I've, no, there, there I'll disagree just because I've, that's the, one of the biggest ways, like I, I've, I still receive sometimes not to toot my own horn, but sometimes I still get emails, random emails, and I'm not looking for work. I just have my uh, business uh, page and my profile up there, uh, but I'll still get pings. Are you interested in this remote communication? Because I think in their world, it is a numbers game. So they're mm -hmm. trying to just fill in roles and, and make sure they get a certain quota. Um, but so I don't think that one hurts too much unless, yeah, unless you're really close to some person in your job. Um, but it, it helps to get feelers out there and you can always pitch them. Oh, well, I'm not interested in that, but do you know anyone who does blah, blah, blah? Or could you, yeah. you know, so it, that one kind of opens the door. So I haven't had a job since 1990, a job since 1998. <laughs> Okay. And I, and I sometimes get that, those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. And that's a, yeah. And that's a whole other thing is, is again, like the system is not meant to support people who want to do fulfilling work. So when we look at recruiters who are essentially cold calling people, um, they're, they're not really care. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but they don't really care whether you're really going to fulfill, you know, be fulfilling and feel good. If that manager is going to really help you grow it's them also trying to do the job and pay their bills so this is where it's like you really i i'm a proponent of being selfish self-centered being self-aware of the path the, the the journey that we're creating for ourselves because in terms of entitlement no one else is going to do it except us no yeah. one else is going to give it to us and um even with the whole support group, like I feel like my family has just had to accept <laughs> Raquel's a job hopper. There's nothing we can do. Um, this is how she wants to live her life. But not all families are that way. And so having to be strong and grounded in ourselves, that which is that holistic element that I talk about, that how are we mentally preparing ourselves? How are we emotionally setting ourselves up so that we can pitch and we can make the moves? Because um, Again, a random recruiter who I don't even work in IT is messaging me. <laughs> Why would I come up on your profile, sir? <laughs> so, yeah, it's something. The randomness of it all. So you yeah. talked a little bit of it. You kind of it kind of took me back, but um, mm. crap. What did you say? You said that fulfillment was it fulfillment? Oh my god! I wish that I could see my tr uh -huh. my, my transcript on the fly. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> um, what did you say? I'm so glad I edited. Okay, hold on. was it fulfillment? Yeah, I mean, I uh, time uh, fulfillment in the in work, in the work that we do. Yeah, so. I, well, I guess I guess it's. I mean, that's the thing. People, yeah, your company that if you go to work for a corporation, the corporation doesn't mm -hmm. care how happy you are. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, some of them do. Sometimes you have a good boss. You know. Well, yeah. I yeah, was yeah, yeah. I was really lucky in my in my first real job that yeah, yeah. it was a really fun company to work for and that we had a wow. really good company culture and it oh sort God. of skewed me 
you know, to, oh, work is fun. And then I went to my next job and I was like, oh, work is not fun. Not fun. <laughs> you know? So that, that whole fulfilling thing, I mean, really in, you cannot, you cannot balance mm-hmm. my job sucks with, you know, self-care. You can't, you can't, right. they don't, they don't balance each other. So no, you, exactly. So, you know, I'm in my fifties and you're a millennial. So we have a whole yeah. different way of looking at the world because we are in yeah. different generations, Generation. you know, but, yeah, yeah. but my generation, we were expected to get real jobs and right. go to work. And right. I, my parents had lifetime jobs. Like they went right, to right, the right. company and never moved. And I, never moved. I yeah. had, I had three jobs, three, I had, yeah. I went, yeah. I had, three career, you know, three careers. Yeah. They were yeah, completely yeah. different from each other. So I job top three times before I became an three entrepreneur. Um, yeah. Even yeah. My, at people my age, we were expected, it was expected of us that we would have right. long-term jobs, even though yeah. things like pensions didn't exist anymore. Right. Right. And so right. it's, it's a generational thing for people yeah. who are my age and above to relate yeah. to what you're saying, even though yeah. what you're saying makes a lot more sense. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And then we add the cultural nuance of, of people who are immigrants, right? And it's mm-hmm. like, why are you even looking for something else? You should just be happy with what you have. <laughs> you should just be happy you've got anything. Yeah. But all of all of that mentality is, is number one, I think, not seeing the current status of the world about cost of living. Even if, even if I were to commit to a job for 20 plus years, that still doesn't guarantee me a home because... 20 minutes from where I live, houses are a million dollars. I I would never, <laughs> even if I committed to 20 years of my life, would I ever pay that house off? Would I ever be able to have the vacations and a family? Like, I know. <laughs> One street over from me, houses are a million dollars. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One street over. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. So it's like, even if we just look about the black and white, it just doesn't, there's no way it could fit. And then my generation, millennials, they say that there's no retirement. So if I don't put my own savings in my IRA, or if I have yeah. a, a good job that from, there's no way, there's yeah. no way. So yeah. that's where that selfishness piece kind of comes in is like, well, even if I wanted to, I still have to think about my needs, my own self. Well, and, yeah. and going back to the conversation we had 20 minutes ago or 30 minutes ago, yeah. if you're making $7 and 80 cents an hour, which is the current minimum wage, which has been the minimum wage since 2012, and you go to McDonald's and you get a hamburger, French fries and a drink, you're going to spend right. two hours of your yeah. pay to pay for that. Yeah, meal. exactly. Yeah. It just, it's ridiculous. Exactly. It's ridiculous no. that we are not keeping up with no. the, the yeah. cost. And yeah. you're going to tell me that the, that McDonald's is losing money on that. <laughs> right. Exactly. 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 <laughs> exactly. No, it's crazy. It's, it's really some, and so in an, an example from my personal life is when I started to build my business, I was making six figures. I was working for uh, Freddie Mac, which I don't know if you all yeah. know. Okay. Okay. So I was well, okay. Explain Freddie what Freddie Mac is for the listener. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Just a little bit. They do. Uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae uh, were uh, commissioned, created from the government in order to hopefully, ideally create ways for people to buy houses for mortgages. Um, they also now at Freddie Mac, they do apartment uh living and so I was working for multifamily which is apartment housing um, and even being in that world hearing that the cost of living <laughs> is enormous and regardless they would do this whole report every year was an annual report of across the country what are the highest uh, places that that are in terms of apartment living I don't know so much about the mortgage part but uh, people can't afford, but people my age can't even try to get into the, the house market, even if we wanted to, on top of the debt that we already have, which is the car, which is the student loan, which is all the things. And then the question becomes, is it debt? Is it prosperity? Is it, is it health? Like, <laughs> what are the things that we have to balance? Um, so anyways, from that job, I was making the money. I was not feeling emotionally what I call emotionally fulfilled I felt like my work I was just sitting there I felt like I was just doing things to to get the money um I decided to go all in in my business and I took a 50 percent complete pay cut so from 100,000 I was making 50 I took a remote job for a nonprofit company and uh 
I don't know if this is just placebo effect or bias, but I was more fulfilled because I was putting my energy and my time and my money into my business, into something that was more fulfilling, was I felt like I was getting more bang for my buck because the long and the, the long game that I'm playing is to help others, not just for me to to make money and hopefully get a house. Like I, I know what my vision is. Uh, so yeah, so I took a pay cut knowing <laughs> that that pay cut maybe wasn't gonna help my career, but I, I didn't wanna be a part of that career anymore if I wasn't but gonna be able to. Really, yeah. it did help your career because you're more fulfilled and when you're more fulfilled, yeah, you do the, the better, the more you fulfilled you are with the work that you do, the better work you do. And then the more yeah. results you have, and then the more you get paid, yeah. you know, that, that's well, that's true. the way it's supposed yeah. to work. That's the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I switched career instead of working for someone else, I decided to work for myself. And so it, in, and I think all of that has been a journey, which was, which is why hopping <laughs> is such a big thing in my business, because it's hard to know until you're in it, until you've spent time with it. Um, I've tried pottery making, I've tried gardening and everything takes time. There's nothing that just is instant. And so the, that, the whole culture narrative of you go to high school, which number one, high school doesn't really give you that time to experiment, to figure yourself out. Yeah. So then you go to college. Yeah. And the way that high school and the way that the education Ugh. system works in the United States now, it's, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're not there to learn about what to do as an adult. No. You're there to take a test. Right you're there to exactly yeah you know and exactly. which and that test isn't a good measure of what you're going to need to do as an adult as an adult exactly so like again the system it's not to fault that everything is the system's fault but to a large degree like it's a lot about how we're being set up or not set up that then it it forces so much on the individual to have to like if i didn't buy self help books <laughs> or or go to therapy when would i have ever had the the chance and opportunity to work through things myself i wouldn't because it's not even if my parents did have the access and the money if they mentally weren't open to it uh and so much of the things happen in our homes in our cultures then I mean, the, the question then becomes how, how do people get access? How do people, <laughs> because there's only so much the individual can do. Um, so, so that's where I feel like the system does really fail people, even if they wanted to be just in a corporate environment, because they're not set up for success. And then you go to college. And if I changed my major three times, <laughs> because I was like, okay, I don't understand what global affairs is. That's not practical. Uh, nutrition is not, I'm not very scientific. So I ended up with the English, very practical in my mind uh, and strategic because it, it did help me move around in my career. But if I wasn't taking those steps, if I just got a degree in biology, but then I, I was thinking to be a doctor and then I decided not to go to medical school, but then, oh, actually, I don't, I don't even know why I got biology. My parents told me to get, so that all these things start to add up and, uh, and all that debt and all that time is like, did it go down the drain? What do I do now? Um, so that's why I'm a huge proponent of hopping because it's like, don't you don't you don't go to Target or wherever and just buy the first thing. You try it on. You see if it works for your body. Does it work in the climate that you're in? <laughs> Does it match your skin tone? Like all these things. Um, there's so much to consider now that my generation and newer generations have to think about before we even commit like dating <laughs> all these things it's like so much has to be on our forefront and and that's exhausting just yeah. to think of all the things well, is exhausting basically what you're describing is dating your jobs exactly exactly yeah. and the thing about today you don't have to marry your job yeah you know it, it, it's not required because you're you're more valuable to them than they are to you Exactly. In today's exactly. society. Exactly. Exactly. I remember I was fired from a job. This was my second job out of college. Uh, I was a technical writer. So I, for those who don't know, a technical writer is someone who typically works as a government contractor. So the government will say, we want to commission this big Navy ship or, or an IT program. And so the technical writer writes the contracts, um, usually RFP requests for proposal to bid and work with whatever government entity. Um, so I hated the job <laughs> because it, it didn't fulfill anything creatively or anything. Uh, but I went all the way to DC. They had me do a whole test, 
do the uh, fingerprints, all this um, stuff. And I got fired after I think a week or something because I was sitting in a way, I was sitting cross-legged on a chair and I didn't even know. It wasn't until I went in and I asked the manager, why am I being let go? Oh, because you weren't sitting in a, a corporate professional way. I said, I went through all of this test. I went through all of this rigmarole for you to just fire me for that. And he said, I didn't even have to tell you because this is an at will. I can let you go whenever without even telling you. So, you know, you, you talk about I, being selfish. I, I'm like, <laughs> speechless. I am speechless. No, I was heartbroken because this was my second job out of college. And I was so excited. Like, okay, I'm finally making 50,000. So, okay, I made a net profit, 10,000. <laughs> I went above my, my investment in my degree and uh, had a round of interviews. So they, you know, hiring manager, the recruiter, a panel interview. I have to prove myself, right? That that's all on the employee to prove themselves. And then finally, after having done all of the, the government testing to get a public trust, that was the that was what I had a public trust. They check your whole, I'm a citizen, your social security, they they do finger tests, I had to go to the post office, a whole thing. And just because I sat for one day that someone else had seen that per, that manager wasn't even there who fired me. Someone else had said, told them. Um, and I was just like, and that was, I think my first light bulb moment. Am I willing to endure this in job after job? Like, what is it going to take to finally be enough yeah. or to finally, to finally feel okay. Yeah. And that's where the employee is, is always on guard is always on edge. Um, and so that's why I, I'm like, do the hopping, be selfish because they really don't care. Unfortunately, yeah. some people do. Some some managers are great. The company may not be great, but the team might be great. Uh, but it's really on on the person to say, you know what, enough is enough, and I refuse, and no thank you, <laughs> and yeah. all these things. Yeah. Yeah. And it, even though it's 2024, women still work a lot harder than men do. Oh, you know, God. and so. You know, there could have been a male coworker doing sitting in the exact same position. In the position, he would have gotten yeah. a buy. I mean, I, that's a horrible thing to say, but it's true. No, but it's true. It's true. No, it's true. It's and true. we we have to work twice as hard to get paid eighty percent. And on top of the emotional labor, people don't think it's a thing because women are we're just so emotional, we're so expressive. Men oh. are also, but we are so much more in tune. The culture has cre allowed us to be in tune with this. The culture has not allowed for men to to be in tune with that. No. So then women are picking up that slack. So yeah. we're trying to handle the microaggressions, trying to speak in a way that, you know, and so and and then the home stuff, all the stuff at home. So the stay at home mom example, imagine I can't imagine for her all the extra things she's going to have to do to start to get into the workforce because she still has to manage the home stuff, which is why we start small. We don't go big. Um, but it, it's hard and, and understanding that it is a, a constant like evolution. It's, it, I can't guarantee them a job. I can guarantee them options. I can guarantee them a more sense of self, but other than that, it, even I, we all have to gamble, unfortunately in this workforce, it, it, we never know. Yeah. All right. We need to wrap up. So this is your moment <laughs> of gratitude, Raquel Sands, for whom or what are you most grateful? My parents. Yeah. Because um, if, if they hadn't done what they needed to do and um, done the hard things, done the hard things to make it easy for me to be able to, to see how they did it, one way of doing it, um, yeah, it would have been, I don't know how <laughs> my whole life and all this trajectory would have been, but I'm really grateful for them. So. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the podcast for grateful micropreneurs building genuine, lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. To connect with Raquel Sands, head over to the show notes at gratitudegeek.com. This is episode 242. I've been your host, Candice Rodarty. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy. I know we can make it easier than